Good afternoon and a warm welcome to all our guests present here. As you would know, that since its inception in 1984, INTAG or Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage is dedicated to conserve, preserve and promote the nation's natural, cultural, architectural and material heritage. And so, the INTAG lecture series was started to further the mandate of spreading heritage awareness and to bring various aspects of Indian heritage to the audience. And today, it is my pleasure to welcome Matai Swan Ostrom. I hope that's right. Good enough. <laughs> <laughs> He's also probably the youngest speaker at INTAC so far, co-author of the book A Walking Tour Ahmedabad, the impetus for which was that information about heritage structures should not be limited to architects or conservationists, but should be accessible to everyone. He will present a composite view of the architectural heritage of Ahmedabad, which has seen Mughal, Maratha, British, and British influences in its culture, food, and architecture. In discussing the urban planning of the old city of Ahmedabad, he will explore the reasons why this city so richly deserves the status of World Heritage City conferred by UNESCO. With masters in urbanism from Technical University Delft in the Netherlands, Matthijs has worked on several projects at the office of Balakrishna V. Doshi in Ahmedabad. Currently, he is pursuing a PhD at the University of Melbourne. Matthijs, all over to you now. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, uh, for having me here. It's an honor. Um, yes, can you full screen? Ah, no, this is good. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the book. Um, now, to, for starters, uh, I'm not an architectural historian by any means. Uh, my, I had a better in architecture and did urbanism and I did urban design and urban planning in Doji's office. Um, so, you know, when writing this book, both me and Gregory, who's also not an architectural historian, were essentially sourcing material by people done, like, you know, working at ETAC uh, and, you know, similar kind of organizations in the box. Um, so it's not, it's not in any way an academic book. Uh, the book was really intended sort of out of a need I had of my own because I came to Ahmedabad well, four years ago, um, and you know there was a lot of material out there, but it wasn't really accessible. You couldn't really take it with you and explore the city. Um, so that book sort of tries to uh, fill that gap. Now I co-written it with my uh, colleague from TU Delft, Gregory Brecken. Um, he also did uh, most of the drawings. Um, so the book. Uh, essentially works like a series of walks. Now, Gregory had already done a number of very similar books in uh, a number of Asian cities. He did Bangkok, Shanghai, Singapore, all you know, very well-known cities, drawing lots of tourists in. Um, and I came to Ahmedabad, essentially unknown really outside of India, um, trying to explore the city on my own, couldn't really do it, and I thought, you know, why not sort of use the opportunity of writing a book to learn something myself about the city as well, as well as making it accessible to people from India, but also perhaps people from abroad. Um, because, you know, Ahmedabad is as interesting and as fascinating as, I think, as much to offer as Bangkok or Singapore or, you know, any of these other cities. Um, so the idea is that there's 11 walks where one walk ends, the other one begins. So if you want, you can do, you know, two, three, and four, you can six, seven, eight. Uh, there's also a chapter that covers some of the sites that are a little bit outside of the um, walkable inner city of the of Ahmedabad. Um, so there's 11 walks, and the structure is you're going to read introduction and map the sites that you can visit. Um, and then really the idea is to take it along with you while you walk. And you know there are only small small bits uh, every 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 single site. <coughs> So you can read it on the go. Um, it's really intended as a as a tool, really, rather than a book that you read at home. Uh, I saw it was available outside, um, so I would be very honored if you would uh, buy a copy and go explore the city, really, because that's the main purpose of the book. Um, 
Now, I was writing this while I was working at Sankat, which is, of course, in the book as well, uh, designed by um, Vivi Doshi. Um, I'm not really going to talk about Sankat today. Um, uh, I'm also not going to talk about any of the other modern buildings that are featured in the book, the museum at the Gandhi Ashram, by Charles Correa, um, of course, the Indian Institute of Management by Louis Kahn, and, um, of course, the uh, the Lovers building by Le Corbusier. And actually, I was thinking, I think it was sort of a happy coincidence that we wrote the book, we published it, and then really a few months after that, we had the UNESCO label for Andalot, so that was not planned at all. But I was thinking, actually, I think Andalot already has a UNESCO building, which is this one, because just before that, I think a total of 20, 25 buildings by Le Corbusier were collectively added to the UNESCO list. Uh, Chandigarh is definitely part of that uh, collective um, um, submission to UNESCO, but I think also the Milner Associated Building in Ahmedabad uh, is part of that. So it might be the second UNESCO inscription of, of Ahmedabad. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the old city, really, of Ahmedabad, because that's really the most fascinating part and also the reason why it got the UNESCO label. Um, this is just a little bit of context of a, a map I made of uh, northwestern India and, and Pakistan. And the north arrow is pointing this way, so it sort of sets you off a little bit. Um, but it just gives the context of the position of Ahmedabad at the moment when most of the inner city of Ahmedabad, most of the pole houses were constructed. And as you can see, it's actually one of the bigger cities in this region at that time. This is around 1700. Of course, Jaipur was founded a little bit later in 1730. Um, but you know, Delhi, Accra, very important imperial cities, but Ahmedabad really the center of um, trade and also cotton and textiles went from mainland in India to Ahmedabad and then exported to everywhere else on the globe, um, which makes it rich and funded much of its architecture. Um, so this is a map of the city. You've got the city wall around nine kilometers long. Most of it is, is demolished, except the city gates. Uh, they're still there. Uh, situated just east of the river. And I'll explain why it is in a little bit more. Um, and at the heart, you've got the Badra Fortress. Again, uh, most of the walls are not there anymore. Um, but it's still, let's say, there as part of the urban assembly. Um, when the city was founded in 1411, Ahmed Shah built his fort. Uh, the Bagra Fort at the, the center of the city. Um, now, to what extent what he built originally is still there, we really don't know. Uh, as you can see here, for example, this clock tower is a British addition to the building. There were also Mughal additions to the building. Um, another major monument that he uh, constructed, you know, right at 1411 when the city was founded, was the the, the Tin Darwaza, which essentially marked the end of the Medan in front of the fortress. The third monument that was constructed just after the city was founded in 1414 was uh, the mosque, his own personal mosque that he used uh, for his own daily prayers as well as his Friday prayers uh, up until the bigger Jama Masjid was built. And here already you can see sort of some of the distinctive features of the Gujarati, the Sultanate Gujarati style that developed here in this part. Um, the mosque was actually rebuilt or, or at least using material from an, an older Hindu temple that was there. So actually when you walk through the mosque you can see that at some points not all the columns are exactly the same and there's strange elements with Hindu references. Um, it's very heavy looking also, you've got the two minarets near the center, which would be a sort of distinctive feature of early Sultanate architecture. Uh, the minarets are, are gone, uh, demolished in one of the many earthquakes that hit the city. Um, the city is also known famously for shaking minarets. There's, I think, four minarets in total that have survived the, the subsequent earthquakes. Uh, not here, unfortunately. Um, so apparently that uh, earthquake measure didn't work in this particular mosque. And then the big one, the Jama Masjid, which was actually, the construction started already at the same time as the foundation of the city, but of course it's very big, so it took around 10 years to complete, so finally in 1424 it was opened. And again, you got more or less the same structure. 
the inner part is sort of quite heavy looking. You've got the two minarets at the, the central arch. Of course, there would have been taller minarets on top of it if they've fallen down in uh, earthquakes. Um, and this was this was the Jama Masjid, is still the Jama Masjid of Ahmedabad, uh, used for Friday prayers. And at the moment of completion, it was actually the biggest mosque in, in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, so now, of course, that's the, the mosque here in, in Delhi. Um, but it shows the importance that Ahmedabad had at the time. Um, now, these four monuments, I'll just again point them out here on the... You got a pointer here or not? No, no, no. It's not. Sorry. At this point, not myself. So you got here in the south, you got the Barra Fort, you got the Maidan, you got Tin Darvasa, you got the Jama Masjid, and off here to the side, you had the um, the Ahmed Shah Masjid, the, the personal mosque of the of the uh, of the ruler. Ah, thank you very much. <coughs> so it's it's turned right. So the river is, is down below here. North is pointing that way. So one of the reasons why the city was founded on this side of the river, according to chronicles, is that the Persian urban planners, or at least the urban planners using Persian uh, design principles, they were probably not Persian themselves, uh, positioned the, the, the Badra Fort and the city on this side to make use of the winds that would come in, so that it would flow across the um, river and cool it, and subsequently the city. Um, there is also Persian in its layout. Uh, you've got this big Maidan, which is a concept that came in there, and you have the, the Tin Darvaza in the middle, and then behind that, you had the market area where um, uh, mostly on Fridays we have markets, but uh, probably also at other times, if you don't know, which was connected to this main trading route. So if you remember the image I showed you of, of Northwestern India, this was essentially the route that connected Delhi to the coast. And it, it's also for no strange reason that the gates on the north side of the city called the Delhi Gate, um, and you know, camel trains would have come in and um, uh, traded here, you know, had refreshments and then moved on again, uh, sold their goods and all. Um, you have the Jama Masjid and then right behind it, this was actually not part of the original layout, is the tomb of Ahmed Shah. So that obviously was only built once he died away, once he passed away. Now, this is more or less 1400, this is more or less 1500, 1700. I mean, there are, let's say, artist impressions. But what you can see is that slowly the city filled up and that eventually, and this is probably also very reminiscent of the situation up until very recently, uh, the original layout of the city, let's say, was very much encroached upon by subsequent development. And it was only up until three years ago that, um, that actually Doshi was involved in a redevelopment plan for the Badra Plaza. So at the moment, most of these buildings, not most of them, actually this triangle has been demolished, so that sort of rectangular design of the original one has sort of been brought back and uh, the whole area is pedestrianized um, so it sort of gets back a little bit of that old atmosphere and also the Badra Fort itself has uh, recently been renovated. Um, so after the city was founded, um, I mean, yeah I'll come back to that later, but after the city was founded uh, there were subsequent noblemen essentially that were invited to settle at his court. Uh, in, in a way, the whole city of was a commercial venture, you could say. Very political, of course, also, but also very much a commercial venture. And the rulers needed people and they needed other noblemen with money to settle at their courts. And uh, one of the things that the noblemen did was they all built their own mosque. And some of them are very reminiscent of the, the Ahmed Shah Masjid, for example, that I showed at the beginning, this sort of early Sultanate style, but you also see that, this is in 1460, that um, you start to see a lot of experimentation happening in the architecture. So in this case, um, the entire front facade of this mosque has been opened up. So none of the heavy looking arches that you had in the early uh, styles. Uh, the minarets have been moved to the side of the building, and you get the inclusion of uh, Jarogas, for example, which you don't really see in the early Sultanate architecture. Um, and every mosque you visit in Ahmedabad, I think there's around 12 in total of different noblemen that settled at the court. We have a slightly different style, a slightly different um, twist. Um, another famous example is, is the Sidi Shahid Masjid, which the, the, um, the sandstone 
uh, Jali's at the back of the mosque are of course very famous and sort of become the semi-official logo of the city in a way. Um, again, this was sort of an architectural experiment. It doesn't look at all like the early, early Sultanate architecture. Um, huh, I'm here. Um, so that sort of, let's say, is the early part of, um, of Ahmedabad. First, it gets conquered by the Mughals. Uh, actually, it was around the same time as this one was constructed. I think it's <coughs> 1573. Um, gets conquered by the Mughals. They also, of course, add their own architectural legacy to the city, but really not so much. I think there's only three, four buildings in the city really that can be attributed to the Mughal rule. One of them is the, the Moti Shahi Mahal, which is actually outside of the old city. And this was the residence of uh, Shah, Jah Shah Jahan, who was the governor at the time of the uh, Gujarati Sultanate, no longer the Sultanate being a separate province of the Mughal Empire. Um, and he stayed here for seven, eight years, I think, before he became himself the, the uh, ruler of the city. Um, this building, of course, completely different from the early Sultanate architecture. This is actually, you know, if you... Uh, typologically, it looks much more like the, the Taj Mahal, in which you have a plinth and you've got the uh, essentially the layout of a tomb that is here used as a, as a residence. It was later also the British came here and used it as their own residence. It's now a museum. Um, also, the Mughals at some point were defeated uh, by the Maharatis. Again, they didn't add very much to the architecture, but they, they did add a few temples to the city. Um, ah, I got this one also. So this is a, a temple that was built during the reign of the Maharatis, who of course were trying to, being Hindu, tried to uh, construct their own monuments within the city, sort of uh, establish themselves as, as the rightful rulers of the city. <laughs> Um, this is part of the Gaibat Forts, um, which is actually inside of the walled city that they used to, uh, as, you know, their residents to control the city. Uh, so this is actually not part of the Badra complex. Um, so you get these sort of different rulers decided to use different buildings in different parts of the city to, to rule the city, which in itself could be quite interesting to map. Um, and then, of course, you got a lot of, especially in the 19th century, you got a lot of Jain architecture, uh, which, of course, is not related to any ruler, but is more related to the, the merchant class and the textile industry that was booming at the time. Um, and a lot of money was being made and put to use in, these, in this architecture. This one is, again, just outside of the walled city. There's also many uh, smaller Jain temples inside of the um, old city. Um, however, none of this, I think, is... Uh, was the reason that it was inscribed as a you know world heritage city by the UNESCO um, foundation? Um, this happened in 2017, just this year. Um, I heard some discussion already before I started. To, just to make clear, the the only part of the city that has the UNESCO label is the old city, with a little bit of buffer zone around it. Um, so. You know, there's also, you know, Modi would say about smart cities and things like that. That's a label that applies uniformly to the whole city. But this sort of heritage thing is just the old city. That wouldn't say that there's no heritage outside of the old city, but the UNESCO label simply applies to that part. Uh, second thing is that Enubat had to apply to get the UNESCO label, right? It's not like UNESCO goes out and, and seeks out interesting places in architecture. I, I, I wouldn't say it's 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 completely a a a uh, commercial or sort of status-seeking thing, but um, you know the, the city doesn't get any money from UNESCO. It's simply an acknowledgement, really, of 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 the heritage. And I think Amdabad City has been trying already to get the label for 15 years, perhaps more. Um, and UNESCO <coughs> apparently denied a few times before they finally granted it. Um, UNESCO has 10 criteria actually to look at heritage and uh, decide whether it's worth labeling it as UNESCO or not. Uh, but the two applied to the end but old city are, are these two. So their second criteria is to exhibit an important interchange of human values over a span of time within the cultural area of the world on the values in architecture, technology, monument, art, stumbling, and landscape design. And I just highlighted here the idea of interchange of, of human values. 
The second one, the fifth one in the UNESCO list that got applied to Ahmedabad is that it is an outstanding example of traditional human settlement, land use or sea use, which is representative of a culture or human interaction with the environment, especially when they have to become vulnerable under the impact of irreversible change. Um, again, there's the idea of interaction uh, between humans, between humans and buildings, and also the idea that unfortunately, um, it is under the impact of, of change and I mean there's two things happening at the same time of course there's a lot of conservation happening in the old city but at the same time there's also a lot of buildings that um, you know there's just not the money uh, to, to preserve them and, and while I was there there's a bunch of buildings that I saw come down myself which is of course quite a shame um, I'm just going to talk a little bit of theory because well I enjoy talking about it and it's sort of my discipline um, the the discipline that looks at urban form is, is well, you have several strands, but one of them is, is type of morphology. Uh, and I won't go into all the details, but when Moudon talks about uh, what we do when we study urban form, uh, she considers all skills, yes, that's fine. But she also sees urban form as a dynamic entity that is immersed in a dialectic relationships with its producers and inhabitants. Uh, so that's very important to me. Um, then there's, well, two other ones, you can read them yourselves. And finally, there's also the idea that um, the idea of a type, of an architectural type, is not something that is really fixed in time, but it's something that uh, uh, progresses over time. So rather than talking about morphological types, which would be in a, a, a systemization of forms just as such, she talks about a typology of morphogenetic things, so that uh, implies the dimension of time in that. Um, all the old architecture, the, the, in the old city, the, the mosques and the Badra Fort and the Pinaraz and, and all that, uh, is important mostly, at least for UNESCO, because of its relationship with the rest of the city and its inhabitants. It's not so much that the architecture itself is, you know, an example of sort of outstanding craftsmanship, which it is, but it's not exceptional enough, let's say, to apply that UNESCO label. What is exceptional enough, according to UNESCO, is, is has to do with the, the rest of the city um, that is inhabited by normal people living in these uh, old houses. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Anlabat or have been there, um, because of course there's a lot that can be said about old houses, and I'm just touching on a few points, so if something is unclear, then just I can answer your question, perhaps. Um, so originally, most of Endabad would be pole houses. Most of it has been destroyed. I think there's around 10,000 houses left, which sounds like a lot, but you know, there's, it's only really uh, a relatively small part of that is still in its old form. But of course, these houses were related to a pole structure, right? How many houses, pole structures, and each pole structure might have perhaps you know, five or ten heritage houses that are really in superb condition. And the rest might be added later or, you know, even concrete buildings. Uh, so they don't really have a heritage value necessarily of their own, but they do have a heritage value in their relationship with the rest of the ensemble of buildings and in the relationship with the pole structure and the various elements that make up that pole, the gate, the pole itself, the well, the water well, the chabutras. Um, um, and of course, in a way, the sort of the odlas at the edge, which are you know part of the house and part of the uh, pole at the same time. Um, so yeah, most of the old houses you'll see in Ahmedabad, and I think there's about seven or eight specific ones that are mentioned and featured in the book. Of course, I had to choose at some point because there's, like I said, there's ten thousand. Um, so seven or eight really. Uh, very nice ones that have been, some of them have been prepared as well, restored recently. Uh, all follow more or less the same structure uh, with the courtyard in, in the center and uh, also the, uh, the, um, the, the well would connect to the underground facility for storage of water, which, uh, you know, because at some point the municipality of course built their own sewage system. So none of these houses rely on their own water tank anymore. Um, but some of the houses have recently restored those, um, so in, in some cases it's possible to see those. Uh, and of course these havelis, you know, they come from a tradition of rural architecture that slowly became urbanized. And I very well imagine that 
most of the very urban looking buildings you would see in the, in the city center of Unlimited right now would have started off as, as huts probably and only upgraded very slowly uh, over time. Um, so this is a map of the old city of Andabad, um, by the Andabad Heritage Center. Um, so again, I'll just point out some of the elements. You've got the Badra Fort here, the river, of course, down below. This is the Darvaza, Damamashi. These are the tombs of the uh, Ahmed Shah, and then his wife was also added uh, after that. Um, this part of the city, as you can also see a little bit in, in the texture of the map, uh, was actually not originally built. So most of this, we don't know the exact extent, but most of this was actually uh, part of a garden complex that would be, uh, you know, mostly, of course, for the enjoyment of the ruler. Uh, here you can see the Gaikwad Fort that the Maratis built, uh, and then of course the British at some point um, came in and took that over as well. And um, most of the let's say, uh, poles that are really uh, uh, worth the UNESCO label are up here in this northern part. Um, and there's this one Italian researcher that did this lovely map of um, exactly the structure of those poles. Um, so again, there's two things, well, three things actually that stand out. This part is empty because that was part of this garden complex of the ruler. Uh, you can also see that up here, the structure of the poles is very different from, let's say, here on the edge. Um, so this part here at the center was actually occupied, well, there's two reasons. First of all, it was occupied much earlier. Uh, so that is one of the reasons why the structure of, you know, the, the size is much smaller. is very different here. The second reason is that a lot of these poles, especially right up against the city wall, uh, were only really founded, perhaps, 19th century, and uh, one of the, actually one of the things you can use to find those um, the image is not a very high resolution, but you might see it here, for example, up here, and up here, uh, wherever you see a pole with straight streets, you know that it was built in the 19th century because um, the sewage that they used at that time, the pipes that they laid, were not able to make any curves. So uh, all of the poles you see with the straight structure, you know that um, they're relatively recent uh, after the introduction of sewage. Now, of course, sewage can go around corners, but uh, not at that time. Um, so, again, talking about sort of the relationship between the buildings and the, the people that um, built them, and how exactly the, um, let's say, the planning of the city happened. Planning, planning I'm using the word loosely here. Um, first of all, there's the royal domain, which I just talked about, with all its very significant architecture. Um, and essentially this was the situation you know, when the city was just founded. There was a, uh, a monumental royal axis going east-west, and then there was the trading route connecting Delhi to the coast, north-south, and at the interchange you had the mosque and the market. Um, initially when the city was founded, you know, most of the people living close by were Hindu mostly. Um, so what you see if you map, let's say, significant uh, Hindu buildings is that they're mostly clustered together here at the uh, eastern end of this royal axis. So the local ruler would invite, you know, Hindu communities into the city, granted them a piece of land somewhere and said, you know, you can build your own uh, 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 part of the city here. And, you know, might have involved yes or not paying certain taxes. We really don't know exactly how that process happened. Uh, we know a little bit more about uh, this image here, which is the settlement of Muslim noblemen that uh, came to the city. And as you can see, they're almost all on the edge of the, um, of the city. So these are the mosques that I just talked about. So when I was showing this image about the architectural experimentation happening in the city, these were the places uh, mostly where it was happening. There's also a few outside of the city itself. Um, the wall here is a little bit uh, misleading because uh, the wall was only constructed after this had happened, after this had happened, and after this had happened. The, mo the wall was only constructed about 50, 70 years after the city's foundation. Um, so it was sort of more like a, let's say, a consolidation of the city 
rather than a, a border that was set up that was then slowly filled in. Uh, of course, that filling in did happen, but that was only, let's say, in the 19th century, 20th century, when the city really filled up. Um, so you have these local centers in the city uh, that would attract people, and they would establish their own um, poles uh, around that uh, node, let's say. So this is another series of maps where um, it's more about the uh, infrastructure network of the city. So again, you've got these primary axis and the trading route and the royal axis. And then you have all these uh, main routes. And um, to be honest, no one knows why they're there or, or why they're built the way they're built. If anyone says they know or claims they know, uh, that's, that's not true. I mean, um, some people would say, well, they're connecting important buildings in the area. Um, which is true in some cases and true and not true in other cases. Other people would say that the way they're laid out is because of the, the natural lay of the land. So one of these streets might have been originally a small creek that would drain water away to the city. Um, and actually when you are in the old city right now and it has rained just after monsoon, you'll see that the old city drains away much faster than the new parts of the city. Despite you know the new drainage that they have in new parts of the city, because um, you know these people that settled here that lived here were not crazy. You know they knew what to do uh, with the water when it came. And of course, most of what is was it collected originally. Now more of it flows over the streets. Then you've got this elaborate pole structure again, mostly in the eastern part of the city. Um, and then there's a few streets which, if you would probably ask a layman in Amsterdam, would would say they're part of the old city, but few streets that the bridge added themselves, and especially this one, I mean it's called Relief Road, meaning relief to the congestion in the other roads of the city, um, was really just bulldozed through uh, the old city. These roads, like I said, were mostly, because this was still uh, uh, mostly open land, uh, part of, uh, of a garden, uh, were less, let's say, had less impact, but especially this one that connected up to the train station that was established there around 1850. Um, and these, I would say, are still the main roads that are used right now in the city. Um, so, I was I was talking a little bit about planning and, and, and that word and how you would use it. Um, there's this very interesting guy, uh, Smith, and he's actually an archaeologist. And he writes about the relationship between archaeology and contemporary urban planning. And, and he says that, you know, there's a lot to learn from uh, the way people planned their cities uh, in the old days. And when he talks about planning, he actually makes a distinction between three kinds of planning. And I think these are interesting in relationship to understanding the old city of Amlubad and perhaps also understanding how to preserve it. Um, on the one hand, you've got the, the master plan, which is really someone, you know, a ruler, an architect, a planner, whomever, who comes up with a design and implements that, you know, consciously on a, a piece of land. Um, which is, when we talk about planning, which is what we usually mean in the modern context. But he also talks about planning uh, in the second one uh, as a standardization, meaning that uh, a little bit like the Hafelix in the old city, because they all follow the same templates, and when one person wants to buy, or let's say build a new house, um, he probably doesn't go to an architect, might go to an architect, might involve an architect, but he would probably go around the pole and say, well, I like this building actually, can't we do this building? I want actually the same plan, but I want an elevation of that building. And you piece that together. So you have a standardization of layouts, but also a standardization of elements that you use to build. Um, so, you know, if wooden elements are available in four meters, then, you know, that's what you're gonna get. Um, so I would say, Amdabad, the old city of Amdabad is planned in a way uh, by this means of standardization, uh, which of course now is thrown off because the, the standardized elements that they used to use are either gone or they're replaced by you know modern standards uh, that really not always fit uh, in this uh, context of the old city. And then finally, he talks about planning as coordination. So someone builds a new house across from the streets. But, you know, what is appropriate for him to build? Is it three meters? Is it four meters? Is it six meters? Is it 10 meters? So there is a certain um, relationship 
uh, a relationship that is understood among the people but is not necessarily explicit in documents or even if you would ask people. Uh, a little bit the same actually applies to the original planning of, of the Maidan and the Badra Fort and, and the mosque. There was a topological idea about how a city center should be imported from Persia. Uh, and essentially, you know, that was not a blueprint, not a master plan. It was a relationship between the fort, the market, the Maidan, the mosque that was important and then, you know, adapted to a local context. Um, what, what is happening nowadays, the way I understand it, or the way I, I like to frame it, is, is within this idea of the tragedy of the commons. So this was, uh, Hardin wrote about this a long time back, and he talked about it actually about rural artifacts mostly. So his famous example was a, a piece of pasture land. You've got people with cows, they come and graze. It is in the personal interest of each and every one of those herders to you know, just let their cows graze as much as they can, uh, and not really think about anyone else. Uh, if he doesn't do that, then other people are just going to use up the pasture and it's gone for him. Uh, and the only way to solve that is to collectively come together and, and say, you know, we only grace this part of the year, this part of the day, or whatever. Um, he was talking mostly about rural artifacts and about, let's say, uh, uh, elements in the landscape, whether it be pasture land or overfishing or things like that. Uh, Ostrom also talks about it in an urban fashion. <laughs> so urban commons, meaning access to clean water, access to clean air, access to light, access to uh, means of transportation to get around. You know, if everyone gets on the road at 10 a.m., it's stuck and no one can get anywhere. So you get this tragedy of the commons repeating in sort of a multitude of ways. Um, and Ostrom, she talks about roughly three ways that Historically, people have dealt with this problem. Uh, first is government protection, uh, second is privatization, and the third, which she is most keen on, is what she calls self-governance. And again, I think these are relevant in the context of the old city of Ahmedabad, to think about how to preserve it. Um, privatization essentially means you have the commons and you're gonna carve it up in individual lots, and everyone is responsible for their own lot, problem solved. Um, of course, that you know that does it does create a lot of problems. I I was reading a little bit about you have these getaways hotels around Delhi, and I won't mention which one it is, but one of them charges sixteen hundred rupees as an entrance fee. Um, so you know, you've achieved one goal, which is preserving the old building, great, but you've also made it completely inaccessible to the majority of the population. Um, so there's very much two sides to that, so let's say, solution to preserving heritage or preserving any other commons for that matter. Uh, the other thing is, of course, that you get lots of gentrification. Now, I thought it would be interesting here to just put together three of my favorite cities. Um, and what, of course, this is Delhi and then Amsterdam, uh, which is my hometown. Uh, Amsterdam actually got UNESCO recognition in 2010, I think. Um, so in that sense, also very similar. What is also very similar is that you know this was founded 1411. Amsterdam was founded 1404, I think. Uh, there were also merchant towns, so in, in that way, very similar heritage. Uh, even Amsterdam, if you would go there 70 years ago, was very slummy, uh, and lots of people were saying, you know, just just demolish it. You know, we don't need these old buildings. We need a metro system, we need parking, let's just get rid of it. Um, and then a few people said, eh, perhaps not. And now it has UNESCO heritage and it's all very wonderful. The downside is, is that because it's so nice and because it's very well maintained and because most of it is essentially in private ownership, uh, there are a lot of gentrification. This part on the western side of the city used to be a workers' quarter up until you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, there's definitely no workers living there anymore, and most of the old city, I'm not sure if you've been to Amsterdam, but it's, it's either hotels, or it's facilities catering to tourists coming to those hotels, or it's perhaps, you know, lawyers or people with lots of money that can afford sort of a prestigious location in the city center. So, um, upsides and downsides to this idea of using privatization as a means to preserve uh, heritage. Um, now the other solution that Osman talks about is, is government protection. And again, there's a number of um, 
um, things that the Ahmedabad government actually has in place. So one of the things which, I'm not sure whether the Delhi government has that, I'm, I'm not very familiar with the context here, uh, but they use this idea of transferable development rights. So especially people with, with money in the old city that uh, either are living there now or have moved out but still have the housing ownership, rather than demolishing it and building something new, they can take that floor space essentially that they're giving up and build it in some other part of the city. Uh, and there's some financial compensation also uh, uh, part of that. So I think that's a very good way because you essentially incentivize people to keep the buildings as they are, improve them without demolishing them, uh, but still, let's say, uh, not give the feeling to the people that they've been cheated out of you know, profit that they could have gained. Uh, the other regulation they have in Ahmedabad, again, I'm not sure whether they have this in Delhi, is this rent control thing. So a lot of poor people in the old city are simply protected by this government rent control, which is very good for the people living in the old city. And it's very necessary in this you know, context of Ahmedabad uh, with a lot of need for affordable sector housing. Um, but it also means that because the buildings are not creating any revenue, there's also not any money available to protect them. And you know, there's many buildings that are collapsing or are you know sort of appropriated by the inhabitants, and they just incrementally add stuff their own, whether it's wood or concrete. So um, again, there's two sides to that. Uh, one regulation which I really don't like, I only see negative sides to that, is this mandatory parking regulation, which to me is completely insane. If you want to redevelop a building in the old city of Ahmedabad um, and it doesn't have a residential function, you need to provide parking. But there's no other option, you know, there's no space on the street, there's no setback you can do it in. The only space to provide the parking is on the plot itself. So you get this sort of weird catch-22 situation where if you want to improve a building, like for example, turn an old house into a restaurant. That also means you've got to provide parking, so you've got to demolish the heritage building you're preserving in order to build the restaurant that you know doesn't work. And uh, so there's several instances in the old city where people came up with initiatives, <laughs> we developed the whole thing, and then the government said no, because you're not providing parking, which you know, especially with a lot of you know smart city walkability metros, to me it doesn't make any sense to have these mandatory parking regulations. Um, and also, Ostrom talks here about the idea of transaction costs. That just means that uh, in order to enforce the government protections, you need to enforce it, you need to check it, uh, you need to set certain standards. Those standards might not always be correct. Uh, so there's also, um, let's say, negative things associated with this idea. Then the third one is um, this idea of self-governance. And this wrap up in a little bit. Um, and this is really the way that I like to see the old city of Ahmedabad, at least originally being this building culture, which Davis talks about in his, his book. Uh, and he defines it as this coordinated system of knowledge, rules, and procedures that is shared by the people who participate in the building activity that determines the form that buildings and cities take. So, again, thinking back about, uh, about the reasons why Ahmedabad became a UNESCO site, and the reasons, or at least the perspective that urban morphologies take when they look at a city, it's very much this relationship between the built fabric and the people, the building culture that maintains that fabric. And at the moment, some of the heritage is still in place, but the building culture is largely gone. And of course, there's people in the, in the heritage conservation community that are trying to bring back that culture and trying to bring back in some of that lost knowledge. Um, but to me, this is really the key thing um, uh, not necessarily talking about how to make money out of it, not necessarily talking about how to protect it with rules, but how to keep alive a building culture that does it sort of naturally. Um, Hakim is very interesting because he, he essentially investigates this idea in, in contemporary cities, uh, mostly in the Islamic context. Uh, he did a lot of research on Tunisia and Tunis, the capital. Uh, and there they have this very similar kind of uh, way of thinking, um, which they call the urf, which is an uh, Islamic concept, which he defines as a habit or a way of doing things that is constantly repeated and which settles well and is accepted by people considered of good character. Uh, now this Ali Adir, we don't know exactly when he lived, uh, but it, it tells you something about the mentality that people had that it was, you know, 
the planning, let's say, using the word loosely, was not fixed or set in stone. It was, um, it was uh, very much the sort of interaction uh, between people. And he talks about the difference between a prescriptive rule and a proscriptive rule. So prescriptive exactly means the building has to have parking, or the building can only be 50 meters tall. While a proscriptive rule is, is uh, much more sensitive, so it might say, you can build whatever you like, as long as the street is wide enough to let a camel with baggage through it. Um, you know, things like that. Of course, that rule wouldn't make sense nowadays, but you can think of very similar rules that would make sense nowadays that uh, sort of allows a little bit of freedom and flexibility to the uh, people in the community. Um, so that sort of wraps up my Amdabad story. Uh, if, I have, if I have time, I'll just talk about Delhi for five minutes, if that's okay. Um, because I'm doing a PhD and my own research is very much about the theory that I just talked about. It's not just, it's not really about the old city, it's about other parts of Delhi. I'm also doing some other cities. This is a master plan land use map, as you might know it or might not know it, I'm not sure, but uh, if you would study planning, this is the map that will be presented to you. Uh, this is the 2020 master plan for Delhi with lots of different colors. Um, but to me, to me, it doesn't really tell me anything. It doesn't teach me anything about how the city works. I'm also not sure how meaningful it is, because of course, all these colors represent a building code. And if you don't know the building code, or if the building code changes, then you know, the color is meaningless or different. And you know, most of it is yellow. I recently saw a map of the Dhaka master plan, and they recently decided that you know, it's too complicated. We're just going to call everything mixed use. And that's our master plan because it was, you know, just too complicated. Then he has made some effort, and we added some red dots, and it looks very nice. But um, I'm not sure whether this is really the way to go. Um, my research looks at, let's say, a different kind of thing. This is a historical map from 1807. So you can see the old city in the uh, in the middle here. Uh, down here is the um, uh, Kutub Minar complex. This is Tuglabat. Um but again, this, you know, this is worth of UNESCO heritage. This is worth of UNESCO heritage. Uh, but I'm not really interested in that, at least for my research at the moment. What I'm interested in is all this in-between stuff, uh, which is this whole complex of villages that existed in 1807, that existed hundreds of years ago, and that still exists to this day. Um, so that's the old city. I've just marked it in yellow, so you can find it on the next map. Um, this is the situation in 1954, so as you can see, the city has grown. Uh, the villages are still there, though. Um, and what happened in the meantime is that um, the British, you know, they essentially found this city. Uh, and then in 1908, they came up with this concept of Laldora, which you might or might not know. But it essentially meant that, uh, I mean, what the British wanted was tax revenue. That's what the only thing they're really interested in. So they said, you can do your thing in your Laudora boundary. Whatever is outside, we're gonna uh, grant you ownership. Again, thinking about how to deal with the commons, uh, and we're gonna get tax revenue from that. So there was this sort of institutionalizing happening that would slowly break down this building culture that was existent in this in these villages. Um, then we move forward to 1954. We get independence, uh, but we also get this urge of New Delhi to sort of impose its rule on the surrounding land. Um, so these villages used to be governed by, you know, Gram Panchayat, who would mediate in conflicts and things like that. Uh, gradually, starting from the 30s, 40s, I think this, in the 60s was the last one, uh, these Gram Panchayats were replaced by, uh, you know, <coughs> essentially abolished and replaced by the uh, Delhi Municipal uh, Corporation. Um, so slowly that was sort of breaking down. Um, now this map was done by uh, Tiagi, who did a research in 1982 about the urban villages in Delhi. So he mapped all of them, these are 135, um, which had been, had been circumscribed by a Laudora boundary. Uh, they've been stripped from their Gram Panchat and replaced with an, a municipal uh, authority, who especially at that time didn't really invest anything in the villages. Um, and he was researching, you know, the ways in which these communities still thrive and do their thing and um, sort of work within the, um, 
regulation that is superimposed on them. Now this is a contemporary map, 2017, uh, finally my work, and what I did was, I mean this is a symbolic representation of villages, you see dots. So what I did, I essentially mapped all the villages in uh, Delhi, and this carpet, you know, this, this existed really already 200, 300, 400 years ago. My own cases are, are down here in South Delhi. Uh, Munirka is 800 years old. My Palpur is 900 years old. So, um, you know, this sort of whole complex thing existed. And in, well, in, in Orange, the city is 1954, right? So in 1954, they decided, well, you know, we're just gonna expand the city sort of pretend that nothing is really there, we just, we'll just do it. Um, and of course it doesn't work like that. Um, so this is, I mean, it's the same map, I just superimposed another layer, which is the, uh, the extent of urbanization in Delhi. Uh, the gray is formal development, or what you might call authorized development, uh, you know, proper development, whatever you might want to label that. The uh, reddish color is informal, you might call them slums, you might call them, I don't know what you want to call them, uh, unauthorized. Um, and what you see is that the, the, a lot of the unauthorized colonies in Delhi are actually village expansions. And sometimes they became part of the La Dora as it was extended, sometimes they were excluded from it, <coughs> sometimes they were authorized, sometimes they were not authorized, sometimes they were bought up by Wealthy people who can always, you know, get away with stuff. And sometimes they're bought up by not so wealthy people who usually can't get away with stuff. Um, so let's say this is the background to my study. I, I'm here uh, this month for data collection, so I can't really, I don't have any conclusions, unfortunately. Uh, I can just show some some maps to just get you an idea. So on the left is the old city of Ahmedabad. On the right is my Palpur, same scale. Um, same scale, very similar structure, I would say. Uh, I mean, I mean, you can see it yourself, but um, I won't go into it. Um, and also, if you look at the, you know, how it looks, also very similar in terms of access structure, building heights, in the way you know the, the sort of interface between building and street is used. Um, so. Whatever I understand I have of the old city and whatever, let's say, perhaps theory you can apply to the old city or conservation ideas you can apply to the old city, I think in equal measure could be used to look at you know, informal settlements in the outskirts of Delhi or in the outskirts of any city for that matter, or vice versa, of course. Um, the other interesting comparison I was going to show you is, uh, this is Munirka on the left. This one is actually in uh, China, Guangzhou. Um, very similar again, also if you look at the photos. Um, and here you can see that, let's say, um, the, uh, here you can see how the building culture doesn't really work always, because people go up to such an extent that, uh, in, in China they call them handshake buildings, because you can shake someone's hand from one street to the next. Um, you get very similar problems in Munirka. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's contradictions here. It's, it's supposed to be regulated by the government, but they don't actually check whether the buildings comply. And the people can sort of do what they want, but they sort of can't. And you've got the RWA intermingling in all of this, and they sort of have a responsibility, but then not really. So, um, like I said, I don't have any answers or conclusions. I'm, I'm really doing my fieldwork just here. Um, but I think you know, these processes apply across time and across continents as well, as you can see. Um, so that was it. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if there's any questions, perhaps. Well, I'm not sure about the old city of Delhi, but in 
in um, I'll actually go to my Balpur. Uh, in the old part of my Balpur, so this is the old part of my Balpur. This is the uh, the main job of the village. Uh, well, I think here uh, there's actually a very old mahal, which the villagers told me was part of some conservation scheme. But you probably know much more about that than I do. Uh, so actually, in this part, you 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 see a few dead end streets, which could imply poles, but they're not they're not gated. They don't have the same, let's say, social infrastructure as the poles in Ahmedabad. They don't have the colony as well. They don't have you know the chabutra or things like that. So it's um, I'm not sure to what extent it applies in the old part of the village. In the new part though, so this is the, the Mahil Park extension, you would see that individual builders would buy a piece of land and subdivide it. And these are essentially all dead end streets that, you know, uh, cater to a main road. And here the residents, because it was a new development and they had to think through what they're going to do and, you know, uh, how tall the buildings are going to be. Here actually you see that I think it functions more like a pole where you can sort of have a building culture that starts to happen. A lot of the old parts of my pulp are occupied by uh, people living on rent, uh, mostly lower cost, poorer people. And actually a lot of the people that used to live in the village moved out towards the extension. Despite it being illegal, it's actually preferable to them because uh, the streets are a little bit wider and they have facilities for parking, the houses, the plots are bigger, meaning the houses can be bigger. Um, um, so, in a way, that building culture is more alive in, in that part of the village than in the old part of the village. Um, I'm not sure whether that answers your question. Uh, <laughs> Have you studied lately the percentage of it that is declining from land to becoming farmhouses? No. <laughs> My question is kind of a take or better tangent, but uh, it was kind of uh, I was just wondering, coming from the Netherlands, do you have a culture there when kind of can and kind of can't that you find repeatedly? <laughs> well, it's... Um, uh, the Netherlands is very on rules. Um, so perhaps not... So, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, a, of an example I know in London, actually. And I think it applies to the same extent in, in the Netherlands, where uh, Dutch people and British people also love their backyards, love their back gardens. And they're usually quite substantial uh, also. And so what happens a lot in these, and even, by the way, now I'm thinking of it also in Melbourne where I'm living right now, um, you have a lot of development happening in these backyards. And that is mostly unauthorized. And some of it is used for the personal use of the inhabitants, but in many cases also rented out to other people. In, in Melbourne they call them granny flats. Um, I don't know exactly why, but they just call them like that. Um, so, of course, it's it's not nearly to the same extent as here in Delhi, uh, but there is some happening if already, and I also think that there is there is indeed a growing realization that um, you know a lot of the sort of urban development that you see in Delhi right now, sort of the DDA flats, is very still modernistic in its thinking and in its architectural design, and much of the Netherlands or, or Britain or Europe for that matter, much of the suburbs are also very much done in that modernistic fashion. You know, believing that it would work and uh, more and more people are thinking, you know, perhaps that's not the way to go. And there's particular parts in Almere, which is a smaller town in, uh, in the Netherlands where the planners now said, we're not, we're not gonna plan anything at all. Well, we're gonna, really, we're gonna plan some parts, but you're essentially free to build your own house and hire your own architect, which is in Holland extremely uncommon. Uh, I would say nine out of ten houses are built by a developer, or let's say a, a, a developer combined with the, the the local authorities. They usually work in partnerships. 
Um, well, so they are, they are rethinking about how to do these things. Because it means, you know, if you can design your own house, it also means you're in control of your own house. And I, at least in Holland, that's something that the people have been missing. You know, their house is very nice. It has all the things you want, all the, you know, electricity, water, and whatever. But it is also your house. Um, and you can't really modify too much. Um, so I, I think there's things to learn, actually. Mm. What you just said is also the same that you said for the Laldora area. Mm. Uh, that the uh, the rules actually began to erode the culture of housing. You know, when the British uh, made the mm. Laldora area, they actually ruined the traditional uh, building culture of mm. within the Laldora. Well, the thing is, because it could no longer extend naturally, it meant if the broader split off and you had to find houses, it meant you had to go up. And you get the disputes and all because you can't really expand so much. Now, of course, that expansion did happen in some parts, so it's not completely true. Um, the other thing is, of course, is that historically demand for housing was really low. Now it's super high, and you know, I talked to many of the villagers, and most of them see money, lots of money, and I mean, I'm, I'm not saying they don't appreciate heritage or anything, but. Uh, 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 there's a lot of money that can be made from a, a six-story building in Munirka that you can rent out to, you know, to subdivide in, in 24 houses. Um, so, I mean, same goes for places I visited in China as well. Um, as, as long as the demand for housing is going to be this high, I think it's going to be difficult to maintain a level of uh, uh, development that is, let's say, um, that really is an attractive environment. Uh, because as you can see in Munirka, that can easily transgress in something else. Um, but I don't have any answer or conclusions yet, so don't. Um. Thank you, uh, Matthias. And we have a small token of appreciation for you. you. And may I request Member Secretary, please hand it over to him. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for coming. Please join us for a cup of tea outside. Thank you very much.